Let's begin the recording, I mean. We've begun. Okay. Well, hello everyone and welcome back. This is part 18 uh, of our series on libraries in response or what is a library if the building is closed uh, that we began in late March and it's now August. It's stunning <laughs> that it, it's that it's been so long and yet it seems you know time is just warped by this phenomenon that we're in this uh, the pandemic but here we are back at it we have a great program today. I'm going to try to keep it uh, the, the intro uh, short so we can get to our our speakers. Uh, let me check to see if uh, Lex, are you on? Mm -hmm. Yep, I'm here. Ah, uh, good. All right, great. And uh, uh, so, okay. Um, reset fundamentals. Uh, this is an idea basically to go back to the beginning, which is kind of inspired by the fact that uh, uh, that we've made s some progress on uh, coping with the pandemic, but at the same time, uh, we seem to be falling back into our uh, native habits of uh, ignoring it, and it's you know, it's it's running wild. Uh, we are hosted today, as we have every day, by the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions with Stephen Weiber uh, at the Controls in Holland, otherwise known as, the, as Netherlands. Uh, thank you, Stephen, both for hosting uh, the Zoom and for uh, managing the session as well. Uh, IFLA and Gigabit Libraries have been partners for several years now around public access, we are championing the idea of universal public access. It's the idea like everyone everywhere should be within some kind of uh, walking distance or short driving distance of an access point, uh, especially now, especially now. And, um, and it's, it's really very doable because we're not talking about giving, you know, smartphones to everybody and, and unlimited data plans. We're talking about a, uh, a library access point or a access station, if you will, uh, in every neighborhood. Uh, this is something that's, the economics are there. We have universal service programs. Uh, we certainly have taxes on telecom services that can pay for a, an endpoint in every community or in you know, every neighborhood uh, to accommodate this. Uh, so, uh, it, it's it's been really interesting work, and uh, we need to press on. Our uh, media co-host is Broadband Breakfast. They're uh, they've been giving us good publicity and doing an extraordinary job on on focusing on a whole range of, of broadband issues. Uh, our speakers today uh, are David Lankus, the director of School of Information Science at uh, University of South Carolina, uh, is with us, and we also have. Uh, uh, Jennifer Hanecki from the St. Joseph County Public Library and Lex Dennis from the Drucker Institute talking about Bendable. This is a new uh, lifelong learning system that they've uh, been working on for the past couple of years from uh, Google.org and, and Walmart uh, and a participation by IDEO in the design of the interface. Really interesting story and we'll, we'll get to that. Um, First of all, let's revisit the environment that's causing us to have this meeting in the first place, which is the pandemic. Uh, we've shown some graphs how, you know, comparing US to Europe and, you know, it's always unfavorable. And this one obviously is the same. We're way, way too high. And this has uh, created all kinds of complications. Uh, contact tracing is, is just impractical at this point until we bring these numbers down. It's no longer about flattening the curve, it's just trying to even uh, uh, basically cope with this. Uh, and we're not doing well. We're starting to maybe respond to the reality of it, but too slowly. Um, sorry for all the text, but this, uh, this New Yorker story from yesterday, uh, I thought really helps us 
keep this in mind as we try to gain perspective. Is this going to be something we're going to deal with for, you know, the rest of the year? Is it going to go longer? So obviously it's going to go longer and it is, it is severe. Uh, people have made light of it, but you know, they're just misleading us and themselves. So, uh, we're unlikely to return to anything like a new normal. No one is talking about getting back to the old normal, which is probably a good idea, but even a new normal is going to be a while before we get there. So if everybody's thinking about, you know, two year planning as well as dealing with it today, then I think they've got a pretty good perspective on it. But that's not the only thing we're facing. Uh, it, it seems like natural disasters, which have been increasing, uh, are not paying any attention at all to the virus. Uh, the hurricane season for this year is uh, projected to be a really busy one. And we've talked before about this role for libraries as second responders. And there's a new network for first responders, you know, police, fire, ambulance, called FirstNet, uh, a nationwide uh, wireless allocation to kind of standardize uh, interoperability among the communications devices for the first responders. Uh, we've been developing uh, a concept of a kind of a second tier uh, community scale network, wireless network that libraries and schools and clinics and other anchor institutions would play that role as a second responder in these large scale events when, well, what about everybody else when, when things go out? It's not just the power, it's also the internet can go out. Uh, and so we've been advising and encouraging communities to think about this and uh, prepare for it and look at deploying some of these uh, community-wide networks with uh, low cost and even public wireless, uh, public spectrum wireless. So we'll return to that. So today we'll get to our uh, presenters and we're very happy and great, grateful uh, for them to make time to be with us today. Um, and we hired a substitute Thank you. Uh, so we're going to start off uh, with uh, Jennifer and Lex talking about Bendable, this lifelong learning system that I just mentioned a moment ago. And then we'll move to David uh, to take us around the world or around, or at least through our various topics. And he's agreed to walk through our, uh, our aspects of this question. What is a library of the building is closed? Eh, okay, that, we've done a, a kind of a mini taxonomy around that question of internet access, digital services, physical materials, and social infrastructure. Uh, and so we'll be really interested to see what David has to say and add uh, to that conversation. So for now, let me introduce Jennifer and Lex. Uh, I heard Lex is on. I don't know. I haven't heard from Jennifer, but uh, why don't you take it away and I will stop sharing so you may. Share. That's good. Thank you. And yeah, I think I saw uh, Jenny a bit earlier. I'm here. Uh, Hi. All right. Hello. Okay. You're on. Thank you. Welcome. Um, the, the, uh, Screen sharing is disabled. Uh, if you could turn that on, that would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, please, uh, Lex and, and Jenny. Okay, now I'm, I'm the co-host now. So yeah. I'm going to, just so Jenny can share later, I'm going to make sure all participants can share. Um, okay, cool. Um, give me one second. Can everybody see my uh, yep. big turquoise screen here? Okay, perfect. Um, I'm going to leave this in kind of my view mode, uh, just as a general disclaimer. Uh, when I, some, for some reason, when I go full screen with Acrobat, it doesn't um, translate when I'm sharing screen. But um, that's fine. Looks cool. great. So, awesome. So um, thanks, Don. And as Don mentioned, my name is Lex Dennis, and I'm the director of lifelong learning for the Drucker Institute. Um, Drucker Institute is based out of Claremont, California, the Claremont Graduate University. But I work locally in South Bend to help make South Bend into a city of lifelong learning. Um, today, Jenny Haneke from the St. Joseph County Public Library and I will be giving you a live demo of Bendable. But before we do that, I want to give some backdrop um, for how we came up with Bendable and how we designed and developed and launched it back in June. Um, so I've got the dry stuff. Jenny's got the fun stuff, um, which is probably mirrors our, uh, our relative personalities. Um, so here we go. There we are. So 
first, I want to speak about the, the why of Bendable. You know, from a, a 30,000 foot view, the idea of Bendable came from Drucker Institute's mission, which is strengthening organizations to strengthen society. Historically, we've had a great success with the first half of that mission, strengthening uh, organizations. We work with a, com a combination of for-profits, nonprofits, private entities, um, public entities even, to translate Peter Drucker's teachings into tools for effectiveness. I mean, that often results in, in programs and initiatives like Bendable. <clears throat> but the second half of that mission, strengthening society, is a bit harder to, it's a bit harder to, to kind of measure that and understand how you're getting that. You know, we thought we were doing a great job at that, but like I said, it, it's hard to kind of capture your impact there. And so that's truly where Bendable was born. Um, in order to launch Bendable, we did something a bit unique. We decided to focus on one city. If you think about it, that's kind of like the smallest unit of society and pull on one single thread that stood the chance of, of truly making an impact on everyone in the community, individuals, um, employers, nonprofits and, and public entities. And what we landed on was learning. So, you know, in addition to the, the missional aspect of Bendable, we know that the nature of work is changing rapidly. Uh, this, is, this, uh, this is a statistic that I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, but basically by this year, 65% of jobs in the U.S. will require some form of post-secondary um, achievement. You know, nationally, we're only at like 46% um, of that mark. And here in South Bend, it's even worse, or, you know, in, this, in our greater region, it's even worse. It's less than 40%. Um, there's also another statistic that uh, we cite pretty often from McKinsey that says that 60% of all jobs will change due to technology. So, you know, it's not just the automation boogeyman coming for our, um, our manufacturing and retail jobs. You know, all of our jobs will change. All of our jobs did change basically overnight with COVID-19, right? Um, and technology was it had you know inserted a, a itself into our our day to day even more. I think this the simple fact of the matter and all this kind of um, background that's swirling around leads to one conclusion that's you know without tools to upskill communities will fall behind on a national scale but also on a global scale. Um, and so, like any dutiful Drucker Institute employee, uh, I like to often turn back to the source, the man himself. Uh, Peter Drucker once told us. Uh, if knowledge isn't challenged to grow, it disappears fast. It's infinitely more perishable than any other resource we've ever had. Um, so beautiful, amazing quote, but I think even more pointedly, he once said, if you think training is expensive, try ignorance, right? So given all of these factors, one thing became super clear to us at the Drucker Institute, and that's to be resilient in the face of socioeconomic change, we all must keep learning. So how do we go about designing and building Bendable. Um, first, we knew that in order for Bendable to, to be successful, it must equip and empower all residents to learn, build confidence, and be recognized for their progress. All residents is important. And we'll talk about how um, we intend to reach all, all residents kind of throughout. <clears throat> but to do so, the, the platform makes customized recommendations from a well-curated set of learning content and support resources that align with user needs. Um, and above all, the platform has been, been designed to be radically accessible um, so that the single mom struggling to make ends meet is just as at home as a Notre Dame professor, is just as at home as Pete Buttigieg. Um, and so that radical accessibility is something that we've woven throughout the whole app. And it's one of the biggest focuses, um, was one of the biggest focuses of IDEA while they were designing. So in order to kind of bring these resources to bear, we're working with some of the top flight content providers. You probably recognize a lot of the logos on this list, um, but we have a broad swath of, of digital learning content that's available for free to our end users. Um, I'll say that again, for free to our end users, certainly not free to, to us, but um, as long as you have a St. Joseph County Public Library card, uh, you can access the, the vast, vast majority of our library for free. Um, so providers like edX, study.com and Penn Foster, um, Khan Academy are all represented in Bendable, but we know that digital isn't enough for, for everybody. So we've also partnered with organizations like IUSB, which is our um, local Indiana University, uh, Satellite, Goodwill, Ivy Tech, which is our community college, and smaller shops like the South Bend Code School and the Forever Learning Institute for seniors. Um, and so with this kind of blend of local and national, we ho hope to offer, you know, once things go back to or go to the new normal, as Don said, 
we hope to offer that blend of online and in-person learning opportunities. Um, I should also note that Bendable isn't just Learn for Work. You know, one of our primary bets is that by bundling Learn for Work with Learn for Passion and Learn for Need, all these things contribute to each other and kind of create <clears throat> the habit of lifelong learning and kind of strengthen those lifelong learning muscles. Um, and so we think all those things, allowing people to rebundle around what they actually want to learn and need to learn uh, will help to strengthen <clears throat> lifelong learning habits. So also along for the journey are uh, some world-class partners that have helped shape our vision uh, for Bendable. Um, one, we have the Drucker Institute. Um, you know, we're leading the project with our aim uh, on nailing it here in South Bend and then scaling it across the country. The St. Joseph County Public Library is, is kind of the local owner of Bendable. Um, you know, their mission is lifelong learning and we really couldn't have asked for a better person, not only when we were kind of envisioning, or sorry, better partner, not only when we were envisioning Bendable, but also now as we kind of implement and make Bendable as local as possible. Um, great partners and we have both, I think, grown tremendously through the relationship. Jenny, you can uh, fact check me on that uh, if you want, went during your turn. Um, so we also worked extensively with the, the design firm IDEO, as Don mentioned, uh, to understand our, our potential users and to design uh, a radically accessible platform. Um, and they continue to contribute to the vision of Bendable. And we also actually poached our, our, um, our main kind of project lead from um, IDEO to work on our team now, which we're super excited about. Um, Carbon5 is a San Francisco based software firm that actually developed Bendable. Um, and so they, uh, they, I don't know if, if any of you from any of you are familiar with Stitch Fix, but they designed Stitch Fix. Um, great shop, great to work with, and I think we all learned a bit about uh, agile development. At least I did uh, through that process. <clears throat> and and we also worked with, uh, we're also working with FSG, uh, an evaluation firm, to help us better understand our potential impact and how we might bake metrics like into bendable into our systems, but also into our processes so that we can help capture that impact. You know, it's super easy for us to use workforce development statistics as kind of like a proxy for our work. But if we're just workforce development, then we're really not um, hitting that target that we set out to, which is really around resilience, um, both individual and community resilience. Um, lastly, I, I didn't put them on here, um, but I definitely need to mention Credly. Um, they were super, in, so Credly is a badging um, organization um, and, and they're all about um, you know, micro-credentials and, and credit based on skills. They helped us to build our, our badging scheme. Um, and we do have places where badges are issued throughout Bendable. And so definitely want to mention Credly. Um, so all these partners are stellar, but if no one uses the platform, a lot of hard work would kind of be for nothing. Um, so we actually turned to actual users to understand their needs and ensure that Bendable added value to their everyday lives. So uh, basically with seed funding from Walmart and Google, uh, we spent all of 2018 listening to residents. We want to understand what they like to learn, how they like to learn, and why they like to learn. And this kind of concept of listening translated super nicely into IDEO's design work because they have the same kind of human-centered approach to their design. We spoke between our team and idea, we spoke with over 2,000 residents. We met them at churches, at work, and even at home to, to better understand their needs. And in this way, we're super confident in saying that we built Bendable with the community, not for it. Um, and that's super important to us. And, and it also um, it shows another place where, where and why the library is such a great partner for Bendable. This community focus is so central to what our success has been in South Bend. And we believe as we expand to other communities, that partnership will be at the core of our success in other communities as well. Um, you know, the, the St. Joseph County Public Library is one of the most trusted organizations in the county. Um, and I think that rings true for libraries across, uh, across the country uh, and probably across the world as well. Um, you know, all the resources are accessible for everyone, regardless of your socioeconomic status. Um, it's great to, to go and hang out. I, you know, I work, from home and before the pandemic, at least, I'd go and work at the library. It's great to see, you know, just the, the diverse needs and the diverse company that you keep when you're hanging out at the library. Um, and, you know, once we're over the COVID-19 hump, we're going to be able to capitalize on the library's geographic reach as well. And, and the library's kind of presence 
in the, the communities and the places uh, that we really want ben Bendable to kind of expand into um, you know, throughout, the, throughout the county. So the last thing I'll note is that Bendable launched with something for everyone. Uh, we want the third grader trying to learn to code and Pete Buttigieg trying to learn Swahili or, or whatever he's onto these days uh, to both find Bendable useful. But for the first version of the platform, we've really kind of homed in on a primary customer. And we refer to this as the center of the bullseye, but it's working adults making between eight and $18 an hour. Um, if we can help make some of our kind of most uh, in need residents more resilient, we can be proud of what we've accomplished. A living wage for South Bend, um, last time I checked the MIT living wage calculator was you know, $11 for a single person, $24 for a single person um, that's, that uh, has one child. And so, you know, we're trying to get in that range of some of our most vulnerable residents. So with that, um, my part of the presentation is done um, and I'm going to hand it over to Jenny, who's actually going to show us Bendable today. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to get right into the demo in a second. But first, I wanted to um, give you a little bit of background about uh, SJCPL. Um, I know a lot of you are from libraries, but I'm the communications manager at our uh, library system. We have 10 branches. We're located in South Bend, Indiana, and we have um, over 100,000 cardholders and have a service area of 167,000. So we're in a mid-range city, um, made famous recently by Pete Buttigieg, who was our mayor, um, political president candidate, uh, which is exciting. And we have been involved in Bendable for the last two and a half years. Um, it was something that we jumped onto fairly early um, because workforce development is something that we're always trying to find ways to better serve our community in that direction. Um, but we've also found that Bendable is a tool for reaching out to our community. So both in engagement and outreach, um, it's become a very powerful tool for us. So with that being said, I will leap right into uh, what Bendable is. And let me know if you can't see my screen, but here we go. Um, this is Bendable. You can uh, go visit the site at bendable.com. Um, and usually when I'm giving this presentation for people that live in South Bend, I start by saying, I'm hoping that you know someone on this homepage, because that's the entire point is that it's hyper local and that these three individuals that you see right here, they are people that are known in South Bend. They are uh, local experts um, that are trusted in our community. Uh, when you go to the homepage, the first thing you see is what do you want to learn? And that's the central question that we hope everyone is asking themselves when they first come to the site. Um, without even logging on, uh, you can get a taste for what's uh, available in Bendable. There's both um, some of our collections and then our resources. Uh, we, we launched in June, uh, which is, you know, we were right in the middle of uh, the COVID-19. The library just started to reopen at the time. Um, so we were able to be very flexible and we added a whole section on the homepage um, to give people resources uh, to deal with the crisis and reopening your business, staying fed at home, um, these sort of things. So it gave us a tool uh, for being able to address that particular need in our community. Also, I think you. Um, we also have a spotlight right now on parenting because I'm sure in many communities um, the prospect of schools opening up and e-learning um, is another area that we wanted to focus on. Um, and then at the very bottom, we uh, the library gets its own section, staff picks and more clicks, and this is where we put uh, library events and programming, but also tie it into some of the resources that are available and vendable. And at the very bottom you see uh, the most popular resources in our community. So I'm going to scroll back up to the top and go to the navigation bar um, because this is when if you were to log on as a, um, a, a patron or someone who's using Bendable, you would want to go here and go uh, to log on. Um, and you do need a library card in order to access Bendable fully. So as Lex mentioned, some of our partners have um, paid seats that we provide. So having a library card is your, your entry point into having free access to all of those resources. Um, but you can also use the South Bend zip code in order to, um, you can use your South Bend zip code in order to log in for a temporary 
30-day account. Um, and that's how people can get in to kind of get a feel for it. And in um, true librarian fashion, we are more than happy to help people get their library card once they've created that temporary account. So we have a system set up internally where we email everyone and help them. We actually mail them their library card and send them um, a digital card information so that we can get them tapped into all of the other resources that we have available. Uh, so this navigation bar is a really important spot for a lot of um, people using Bendable. If you go into the My Stuff, the first thing that you're going to want to do is to um, set your preferences. Um, and these are uh, prompts to help us define how you like to learn. Um, because we know everyone learns in a slightly different way. So whether you like to learn online or in person, um, in small um, bite-sized chunks, you have five minutes a day to kind of get a quick lesson in, or if you have time for a longer session. And then also what topics you're interested in. And that's because once you've set your preferences, the home page will curate itself around your interests. And then as you dig more into Bendable, it will continue to change and grow with you as you explore the platform more deeply. So also in my stuff, there's a few areas like my bookmarks. This is where you can go on and in that uh, top right corner, you can select items that you'd like to return to later um, to continue to, to experience and to explore. Um, in progress or resources that you're in the midst of, um, I finished this, are things that you've completed. And then also my gallery is an area I like to point out because we both have built-in achievements that you earn along the way in order to encourage and motivate people. Um, just, you know, something as simple as bookmarking resources or returning to Bendable a few times, you know, those are first steps to making learning part of your normal habit. So these achievements are ways to congratulate people on things that may seem small, but are actually really big steps in, in their progress to become a lifelong learner. This is all the, also the spot where uh, Lex mentioned Credly and uh, the credentials. And as you complete resources, the credentials go here. And these are things for our career collections and some of our career resources that you can um, add to your resume. And they actually give you a leg up when you're looking for a new job or trying to get a promotion. So it has a very real um, workforce uh, development tool aspect to it. All right, so the next part on the navigation bar is I'm gonna go to explore. And this is a really great way to be able to navigate everything that Bendable has to offer. So we have our search bar, which also as Lex mentioned, um, we, we designed this to be very accessible. So we wanted someone who's 95 and they got a smartphone for Christmas um, from their grandkids. We want them to be able to use it just as much as a, you know, a 12 year old or someone who may have lower digital literacy. So the prompt is I want to, um, I want to learn about kids. Um, I want to help, some help uh, with time management. And you can use those terms in order to search in the search bar. Um, this section right here are our career collections, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about. Um, but further down, we have browse categories. And this is another way that you can explore uh, the different resources available. But I'll begin. So I want to, and I'm just gonna say kids, because I'm interested right now in how do you manage a four-year-old when you're trying to work from home? So as you can see, it serves up, I got 240 items, um, and it's a range of uh, collections, internet safety, financial literacy for kids, um, some games. So there is a very uh, broad array of topics that are included in Bendable. Oh, actually, I'm gonna go back to explore. And the other, let's see. I'm also gonna show you one of the browse categories. And I'm going to go into better understand technology um, because this both shows the different providers. So we have a combination of uh, national LRNG, study.com, edX, Penn Foster. Um, and our library system uses a lot of different databases. We have Linda, um, we have, we used to have Gale, um, tutor.com. And this is a nice way to be able to have access to everything from cell ed which is for foundational learning skills. It's a text-based learning provider to things like Penn Foster, which has a high school um, equivalency and also um, study.com and edX, which are really for advanced learners and people who um, in, you know, enjoy taking more advanced college level courses. So you have a lot of national providers um, and then we have our local providers like Goodwill, La Casa de Amistad, um, IUSB. 
And right now we have an even mix of local and national providers. Um, and you can see we have some in-person activities and some online. Our in-person activities are obviously um, hindered a bit by uh, COVID. So the other thing I wanna show you, uh, because this is near and dear to my heart, but it's also the heart and soul of Bendable is the community collection. Um, these collections are, uh, we call them playlists of learning resources that have been curated by a local expert. Um, these are your neighbors. These are uh, both the people that own businesses, but also just the people that know how to do things. You know, the, the guy that knows how to fix a bike or Alex Sade and I, who is co-founder of South Bend Coast School. Um, and her collection is how to get started with coding. And these playlists can include in-person opportunities. So Facebook groups or meetups. Um, they can also include YouTube videos, podcasts, TED Talks, um, books, of course, articles. Um, and you can see hers includes both like the Technology Resource Center, which is um, an in-person uh, resource center in South Bend, but also Code Academy and Code.org. And I believe she's got Scratch down here also. Um, so it's a way for us to both leverage all of the things that our community knows and to democratize learning by putting all of that knowledge that our community has and all of these resources which may not traditionally fit into you know, a library on the library shelf. You know, it's hard to put a YouTube video, which everyone uses in order to you know, learn how to fix their bike onto a library shelf. And this is our way of being able to do that, which um, and library staff actually uh, curate these and do the interview process and work with the community in order to create them. So it's been a fantastic way for us to work on our storytelling and to really be able to engage deeply with our community. So I get very excited about community collections. Uh, this, is the, great, uh, mm -hmm. this is great. Can you, can you wrap here? I, we've got a couple of quick questions and, and then we'll oh, move. Okay, on. sorry. Um, yes, actually, so I will wrap up here, but the one thing I would say, we also have career collections, which are similar, but they're backed by local employers. So we have them in IT, healthcare, and manufacturing. Um, and those are the things that as you complete those resources, you get badges that can be used uh, for credentials in those industries. So with that, um, the last thing I will say, I'll just show you how once our big goal, and this is probably unlike any other app or platform, is that we want you to leave our app and we want you to go and learn something. So we get really excited when people leave the platform and go someplace else. So thank you. Sorry that I- uh, No, no, this is exciting. And uh, you know, an incredible piece of work. This is a conversation been going on for so long about lifelong learning. We're in a era of lifelong learning. Well, you know, it's easy to say, but uh, you've done an extraordinary job of implementation, the whole team, obviously. Uh, a couple of quick questions. Uh, obvious one relates to language. How many languages do you support? Uh, is it currently only available to people that are that have a uh, a St. Joe library card? Is it out anywhere else in the U.S. or even outside of the U.S.? Uh, um, how about start with those real quick? I'll I'll hand it over to Les because he can answer most of those. But we are right now. It's just in English. Um, but we're really excited because one of our um, communities that we work with very um, heavily in South Bend is the Latinx community here. And we are working on getting some Spanish uh, resources, a, a pretty substantial collection of Spanish uh, learning resources in the system. So that's to come. And that's to say, I think Benville right now is very much in, we're building it. Um, it exists for South Bend, but it's, it's always improving and always growing. Yeah, we refer to it as, you know, <clears throat> a lot of times, Companies will throw around the term MVP. Uh, we use you know minimum viable product. We use MVA, minimum viable awesome. Um, so we are still in minimum viable awesome stage. Um, you know to answer the questions about geographic uh, reach of Bendable, it is limited to the Saint Joseph County, um, and you know we want to laser focus in on one community because we think that um, making Bendable reflective of a community is the true way to engage learners. Um, and that's, you know, our partnership with St. Joseph County Public Library is kind of emblematic of that. Um, you need to have a St. Joseph County Public Library card to access all of the content that, that we are paying for, we being the, the Drucker Institute. Um, but if you don't have a St. Joseph County Public Library and can't make a profile, you can access all the free resources. So you know, GCF Global, um, a lot of the library's content. So um, that's kind of the distinction. We will expand to other communities. Um, communities only in the U.S. we're focused on right now, um, but 
uh, for right now, yeah, in order to get, you know, edX content or um, site.com content, some of the paid stuff, you do need to have the St. Joseph County Public Library. Excellent. Uh, yes, I like that uh, focus on the awesome aspect first. And, and I, I think you guys have come really pretty close. Uh, 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 Lex has offered his slides. Uh, there's, they're not a link, but he'll, he'll forward them to me and I can forward them on to anybody that asks for them. You all have my address, the info at giglibraries.net. And so if you'd like these slides, uh, send me a note, I'll forward them on. Um, I have more questions, a lot of questions, but we need to move on here. Uh, it's an extraordinary partnership with the, with the local library, which is yet another story of how that happened. I believe the mayor actually nominated the library as the, the logical manager of this system for the community as opposed to the city, which has a, a, a more diverse uh, kind of set of responsibilities and, and maybe is more prone to the vagaries of uh, politics and budget than the, than the library. So this is a great story to be following as we go. Maybe we'll have you guys back and give us an update on what's happened and and where else this is uh, taking place. So with that, I wanna shift over to uh, our David Lankus, our uh, esteemed librarian from the University of South Carolina, uh, noted author, speaker, writer, visionary, et cetera. I don't wanna take another 20 minutes just introducing David. So David, please uh, take us away. Thank you very much. I appreciate you having me today. And, and I, I love the lineup because you guys set me up so well. First of all, very impressive, bendable. Um, and I think it really shows a lot of how libraries have changed over the past well, 10 years and really depending on, they've been constantly changing over 4,000, but in a concentrated way over probably the past 15 years from places and collections and materials to learning and empowerment and impact. And so that change uh, has really I think brought in some pretty strong questions about, so what is a library anyway? And because it's not really the same as what it was 10 and 20 years ago, it wasn't the same as five, it's certainly not the same as it was three months ago. And so in talking with Don, it really became a sort of thinking about how do we conceptualize the library these days? Um, and I asked that because it's easy to look at something like Bendable and a lot of times it's like, well, why is that in the library? Oh, it's in the library because it's got a bunch of stuff in it. It's a, it's a new collection. And what I love about that, the presentation was, yeah, it's got stuff in it, but really it's a new set of capabilities. It's a drive for impact and assessment. It puts learning at the center of what we're doing. And the library is a natural way to go across all aspects of a community as well as support it. And I think that the one of my takeaways was um, the question isn't how can I help you today? It's what do you want to learn today? And I think that is a much better question because I think Librarians are, are fixated on the notion of how we can help, but that phrase, how can I help you, if you think about it, is an extraordinarily arrogant phrase. It's kind of like, how can I help you? Because clearly, you can't help me because I have these large stacks behind me, et cetera. And so it all comes back to the idea of what is a library. And, and, I, and um, so I've put together a few slides, but please interrupt. Um, as you have other ideas, and let's see if I can make this work. So you are seeing a slide, I hope. We're seeing yes. partial, or maybe it's just my screen, but we're not seeing the full slide. Oh, Is anybody sorry. else seeing the full slide? Uh, yes, we are. Oh, you are? Okay. All right. Yeah, we are. Okay. okay great. So run into it, and I'm going to just say it anyway. They're more for my memory than for anything else. So what is a library if the building is closed? That's the question that I've seen on, on the Giga Libraries website. That's the question that we talked about a little bit. And I think that we've done a fair amount of thinking about this that I wanted to share. Because why does this question even matter? I mean, a lot of times, and rightfully so, we've all been in a meeting where we just declare navel gazing and walk away. Why bother having this question over and over and over again? Can't we just go and do it? And the answer is yes. but I think what we've seen here in, in the beginning of this year, and it's only been six, seven completed months in this year, with the pandemic closure, it really drives this question, right? Because 
most libraries never close their online operations. When we talked about COVID closures and locking down, what's interesting is just about everyone in that is chaotic, it was quick, and the message that went out over and over again is the library is closed. Now here I'm talking about public libraries primarily, but the same thing in academic libraries and school libraries, we're closed. But of course, we weren't really closed. We closed the physical facility, but most librarians were still employed. They were working at home at a distance. They were doing digital reference. They were doing providing uh, access to materials. And when you look at some of the things they were doing in the early months and to today, it's kind of sort of telling. The first thing is that, that many of the libraries left Wi-Fi on. And in fact, some libraries went ahead and invested in amplifying their signals, as did many schools, so that you know, drive-in Wi-Fi access became a thing. Um, right next to, you didn't have to drive into the parking lot of uh, Taco Bell anymore. You could go into a library and seem respectable that you're sitting out there. Um, and I had a, one library director who said, providing Wi-Fi to people in the parking lot is quite literally the least we could do. I mean, if there's, if there's anything, I mean, technically we could have unplugged the Wi-Fi, but it was easier not to. And so when we began looking at what were libraries doing in response to this, we saw, for example, online story times. Uh, Chattanooga um, Public Library talks about, they've had a massive, like thousands of people showing up to story times and sharing um, from all over the country, which is interesting, by the way, because when doing that, we also exposed these massive copyright issues where we wanted to do this good thing for children. We wanted to do share stories. And we figured out really quickly that there was a whole sort of regulation framework that was not set up for doing this virtually. It's no problem to do it in your library, but the minute you send it out on Facebook Live, things get interesting from that. We saw, for example, one of my favorite things is uh, seeing a public library asking what they did um, as they closed their physical facility, they said, the first thing we did is we got on the phone and we talked to our regulars. We talked to seniors and we talked to families that would come in, folks that we knew might well have a hard time shaping with this, and we did check-in. We've seen that expand in places like San Francisco and Los Angeles. And I know there was a discussion last week in talking about internationally, how librarians have been retasked or given additional duties for doing contact tracing. Um, I love this idea, by the way. I know a lot of people say, oh no, contact tracing, that's a real privacy nightmare. We don't want to go there. But I think the answer is, no, no, librarians are doing this with public health officials and are doing it because they're bringing their concepts of privacy. And it's not just a matter of calling people up and saying, all right, you got it, where'd you get it from? They're calling up and what we want is with people who've been diagnosed to stay home. And so librarians bring a real service mentality into this concept so they can say, what do you need so you don't have to leave? What services can we bring about? How can we arrange for, from medical to food to recreation for you? And what we've also seen in, in the closure is a real expansion in digital collections. A lot of people like the um, New York Public Library put a lot of more money into their holdings and distribution um, and digital reference service, answering questions online. But what I want to talk about why this question matters is that's all good and we can pat ourselves on the back for doing good stuff, but it, there's also been a pretty substantial tension over reopening these facilities. Um, the tension, if you spend any time on the library Twitter sphere and social media sphere, it's gotten pretty tense about frontline workers and management and who are we doing this and why are we doing this past? How are we going to deal with safety? What do we do when people come into physical facilities and don't wear a mask and how do we police this? And by the way, what is our relation to the police, given the new expansion in Black Lives Matter and some of the protests? What we've seen in the reopening conversations, not just among librarians, but in the public with libraries, is this sort of reinforcement of a nostalgic view of libraries. That is, um, John Palfrey wrote a really great book called um, Bibliotech, and he said the, the sort of scariest thing, the worst thing for libraries is nostalgia. A lot of people have a concept of a public library from 20 years ago when they were 10 years old. And the problem is not just 20 years out of date, it was through the eyes of a 10 year old. And so we have to constantly readdress this. And so what we're seeing are mayors and county executives, we're seeing provosts and deans, we're seeing principals say, oh, you've got to reopen because people need their library. And you're like, but they still have their library. 
No, no, no. They need their library, and therefore that is defined as the physical space with a lock on the door. And so being able to better articulate what a library is helps us begin to address why we're doing some of these things. How do we address the community? What is the community need? What is the impact? And so the other thing that has been really clear, um, and this is once again why I'm very impressed with the bendable is because I think it, it, it does a good job of answering this question. If you look over the past 15, 20 years, there have been two streams uh, of development in librarianship. One around the community, that a library is a community hub, a community center, it's a movement, it's the, the community's living room, it's all about the people and coming together. And the other has been about digital. So the picture on uh, the left is the new Oslo Public Library. And the picture on the right is the, for, is the petabyte data center run by the Vatican Library that's been digitizing manuscripts back to the first century. And these two streams have been going and we've always sort of assumed they've been moving in lockstep or they're the same movement. And yet when the pandemic came, one of these pictures kept going and one of these pictures closed. And one of these pictures, which is the data center, had a whole set of services about materials and stuff and things. And one was all about access, empowerment and people and conversation. And we found out that they weren't being developed together. And so what we're really finding from the pandemic is how do these two things fit together? How does Bendable, for example, not only provide resources, but provide education, tutoring, access, empowerment. It's all about the people connections. I love the fact of not only local curation because the library is shared with its community, but working with local employers, working with local education institutions, working with partners and the community themselves to provide materials. That's a fascinating thing. So, well, how do we define a library? So I've long contended that a, a room full of books is simply a closet. Uh, but that an empty room with a librarian in it serving his or her community is a library. So that's my funky definition. Um, but it comes down to the idea that we've, you know, a library we know is much more than just a place. What we saw, for example, well, it's still going on, but particularly about six years ago in the UK, in the United Kingdom was a lot of libraries when the, the, the national government gave more control to funding and opening and running the libraries to local uh, councils is local councils some of them said well we've got a building we've got the books let's put a volunteer in there and we're good we can save money and they define the library as that place and that stuff and what we found is it doesn't necessarily work that well because the stuff doesn't gets old and needs to be put back in the right place and by the way it's the reason people are coming for the stuff that matters not the stuff itself because people were coming to learn to escape to do all these things and that required professionals in the world to do it. So to make this a little bit more formal, a library is a mandated facilitated space um, maintained by the community, stewarded by librarians and dedicated to knowledge. So let me break that down a little bit. First of all, it's a mandated space. That is whether it's through a, a charter, whether it's through law, whether it's through public law, there is a mandate to do this library. It's not enough to just show up and say, I'm a library, have fun. It really has to be serving some purpose. It is facilitated space. That is, it's not just a room full of books or just a room or a room of anything. There is activity and an active human process that's going on in that space. We're gonna come back to facilitate in a minute. And notice, by the way, space here is not physical space or virtual space. It can be either, and frankly, most of them are both. And so you can have true digital libraries that are mandated and facilitated spaces that don't have a physical presence. Maintained by the community. Most of that time, um, a lot of people up to this point, that's through tax dollars, through tuition, through what have you. But it also, and once again, I'm just going to keep calling because I'm in love with, with what I just saw, you know, it's the community coming in and providing content, providing their insight, really co-authoring. There's a great library in uh, Pistoia outside of Florence, Italy, the San, San Giorgio Library. They have 14 librarians, but every weekend they would at one time would have 50 different programs going on. And those programs were offered from the iron worker to the home cook to film critics to whatever coming in and sharing their knowledge in that communal space. So maintained means given resources to go on. 
stewarded by librarians. That is that librarians have a management function and it's not a passive function. They're actively thinking, conceptualizing, determining need, going out, producing, projecting, pushing, and dedicated to knowledge. That it's not about collection and grabbing it together. I, I always, people who think that libraries are about books really need to rethink that a lot because if you were about the primacy of books, the first thing you wouldn't do is buy it, put it in plastic wraps, slap stickers on it, and then loan it out to four-year-olds and hope it doesn't get hurt, right? That's if you're book focused, that's not what you do. But if you're that four-year-old focused, that's exactly what you do. So dedicated to knowledge and learning, whether they're learning for themselves, for pleasure, whether they're learning to find a new job, whether they're learning to go back to school, whether they're learning to find fulfillment and meaning. Learning and knowledge is at the center of what we do, not a service added on top. This library, so if, if the librarians are the stewards, their mission is to improve society through facilitating knowledge creation in their communities. So why do libraries maintain and build these libraries? Why don't they just go out and do what accountants did, close the accounting houses and go work in local organizations? And the answer is because they're working for the library, they're working for communities. And so librarians are to improve society. We have a, and that means we have a sense of what improve means. We're not passive and neutral agents. We're not objective people out there thinking about it. We're people who look and say, we can make this world better. We can make this world better through providing online services and licensing to these micro-credentials. It's um, Topeka, Kansas. We can do this by first having librarians and then training a whole core of literacy experts to go into the, the, the community and the most needy parts of a community to promote literacy. It's in the idea of providing all these different kinds of services to make society better. That's not neutral. If you, if you have a sense of what a better society is, you're not a neutral observer of that. You're not an advocate. And librarians are advocates and they seek to turn their communities into advocates. Through facilitating knowledge creation is a big fancy way of saying helping people learn and embedded within a community. And that community matters because what that looks like in South Bend, what that looks like in Columbia, what that looks like in Pistoia, what that looks like in uh, Vietnam, what have you, all of these things are really truly contextualized. And that's a very different way of how we used to think about libraries, which was guided by early 20th century concepts of efficiency and industrialization. I'm an academic, I feel like I have to say things like that, but the truth is it comes to, we're changing the idea of just being a big box store that provides a bunch of stuff to truly providing a local community. When you are in, walk into your local library, school library, academic library, public library, medical library, law library, it should look and feel like that community, not some generic library like they look all over the world. Now I kept talking about facilitating. And so what do I mean by facilitating? What do we, how do we facilitate? That's a, is that a, just a sort of squishy word? There are four ways in which librarians do their job. They facilitate knowledge creation. These come from actually the digital divide, which is you know, what we're gonna talk about in a minute, which is we know that access is important, but insufficient. In the days of, um, we, you know, Don and I were taught having, you know, I think we were doing the, no, no, I played this game longer. Um, <laughs> you know, how old are we today? Uh, conversation when E-Rate first came out and even before E-Rate, when, when we saw the first, um, computers going in, I was about to say laptops, but even before that, when they were going in on teacher's desks, the idea was we put a computer on a teacher's desk and said, congratulations, there's no more digital divide issue. And what happened is the teacher said, yes, I have access to this machine, but I don't know how to use it. I don't want to use it and go away. And we you know, began to, instead of putting the computer on the teacher's desk on the first day, you put it on the last day and then you gave them the boxes so they could take it home over the summer and do and learn about it so then the next day they were ready to go. So what are the four ways in which librarians facilitate knowledge, learning? Access, yes. Access not only to materials. There's still a great reason to have collections of books and databases and things that no individual could afford. It makes sense to gather together money from the community, from grants, from whomever, and pay for access to things. Access to a physical safe space. Access to each other. 
And that's also important, which is one of the things um, when you look at platforms, it's not just a matter of here, let me broadcast stuff out, but let me put you together with other people who are really interested in this, the social aspect of this, which is to learn together and learn with people of like-minded um, ways of doing it. It's the human library model where people would come together to learn about people who weren't like them. That was providing access, but it was a two-way access mechanism. It's not enough, for ex example, for us to train people how to download and consume podcasts. We need to provide facilities so they can share their ideas out to the rest of the world. And you see this in library after library that are building studio spaces and recording spaces and green screen spaces so that they can, in fact, share their knowledge. It's in knowledge itself. So once again, having access to the internet, having access to a book, having access to a, a smartphone is useless if you don't know how to use it. And so you could call this training, but it really is that idea of supporting so people have core skills in order to go empower and learn and make meaning. And an environment. So once again, you have access to the internet. Um, you have through things like white space and through microwave transmitters and all the great stuff that's going on in this group. You have a knowledge of how to use it. This is how to click on it. This is what it means, et cetera. But are you in an environment where people are, are comfortable doing that? I'm going to use the teacher example for a moment. They were bringing these laptops and computers in the classroom. And the last thing they wanted to do was use it in front of 14 and 15 year olds who probably knew more about it because their entire life with job was to learn the technology. And so they didn't feel safe doing that. They didn't feel comfortable joining in. What we're seeing right now in the US and worldwide with Black Lives Matter, with the idea of looking at systemic white supremacy, looking at anti-racism issues, is we're seeing that libraries that we traditionally thought of as safe spaces were not. Even, the, and that isn't a matter of hosting the neo-Nazis and et cetera because of public access laws. It's a matter of do they see their faces in that group? We run a library here at South Carolina um, in the School of Information Science. It's called um, SKILL, the South Carolina Community Literacy Center, and um, Center for Literacy. And it's full of children's books. But what's amazing is working on um, the tradition around Augusta Baker is that those children's books are used to teach teachers and future librarians about how it's important to have representative narratives of a community. You know, how it can't just be a bunch of you know, white affluent privileged kids going to Narnia, we need to show people themselves in these narratives and these possibilities. So how do we create an environment where people feel welcome, where people are willing to participate, where people are willing to share and learn? Because le learning usually dry is, is, is based in part upon repeated failure. Trying something and having it not work is usually more educational than trying something and having it work the first day. How do they feel comfortable in doing that? I often say that a library should be, should be a safe place to explore dangerous ideas. All right, how safe is this place? And then lastly, motivation. So I've got my computer, I know how to use it, my uh, kids won't make fun of me, my principal's gonna be support me, whatever it is, I just don't wanna. <laughs> I just don't, I, you know, it's gonna be out of date, it's gonna be out of phase and I got other stuff I wanna do and why should I do this? And that's where motivation comes in. And libraries have spent a lot of time worried about ex or intrinsic motivation. I wanna learn for myself. I go to a library because I want this book. I wanna learn about this. I wanna do this. And it's essential and important. But we also need to be aware of extrinsic motivation. You're doing this because in a school setting, you're doing this because the teacher assigned it to you. A professor made you go do this. Right? So how do we deal with extrinsic and intrinsic motivation so that we're helping people learn? And so this, what it comes down to is all of this is a big long way of saying what is a library is a place for people to learn that's, that's been owned by the community, facilitated by librarians, facilitated in these ways to help people learn and make better meaning. And what's interesting now is we're having to rethink how we've done that. The coronavirus, we had to rethink it anyway, but the coronavirus, the economic downturn, racial inequality and protests have really driven the fact that the way it used to be, the old normal, can no longer be the new normal. And a lot of times the new normal, that phrase, is meant on things that we can't do anymore. We can't hold hands and hug and we can't 
go to big crowded parties, though unfortunately too many people do. Um, and I wanted to really think about what's the positive side of this? What should be the new normal? This is a chance for us. This is a chance for the library community in every country to sit there and say, let's fix things to make a more just and equitable environment and world. We know that for too many places, I, I love the idea that the community being a sort of a cornerstone, the atomic unit of a community, but we know that national leadership matters. We know that county leadership and regional matters. And we know that in this COVID, it has been, let me just say, unequal at its level of implementation and leadership and success. Our communities are going to come out of this scarred. They're gonna come out of this with mental health challenges. They're gonna come out of this with economic challenges. They're gonna come out of this with existential challenges. We're really seeing a situation that as these months go on, we're seeing that people are coming as in a different way and libraries are going to be instrumental community organizations to help re-knit the community together. And when we re-knit this community together, it's essential that we don't just try and make it look like it was before, but that we truly address some inequity. For example, access and broadband. To this point, broadband has been a matter of us providing access points, people coming to us, our parking lot model, the idea that we would advocate for E-rate and take E-rate and bring the fiber into the library and we would become the uh, safety net for a community. We need to think very differently about that. We need to think about true universal broadband access, just like we, in the past, last economic massive crisis in the depression, talked about universal electrification. We need to talk about how people get the internet with them because it's no longer an option. If you want to study, if you want to do a job, if you want to access and deal with your community, you need internet access to do that. And we're not always going to be able to provide that in a physical space. And so we need to move the notion of the internet being a consumer product to truly a utility. And once again, I know I have an international audience here, mostly the US needs to fix its game, but we're seeing this very much in other areas. I'm remarking on that picture of the Oslo Public Library. The Oslo Public Library, which opened this year, beautiful facility. Um, it opened with half the collection of the previous downtown library. It moved a model where the downtown central library was the library of last resort to it being the downtown branch. And when they moved it, they moved it with half the collection. And I asked, is that so you can build up and weed and, and make room for more? And they said, no, we figure we need about half. The rest of that facility is meeting spaces. The rest of that facility are theaters. The rest of that facility are maker spaces. The rest of that facility are event locations. It's about changing that thought. And so we really need to think about what is that space and how do we bring them together? We know we need to do workforce development and training. We know that workforce development and training is essential to help people find new jobs, move to new jobs, to make up for jobs and truly be ready for how we work at a distance, how we work when our cities do change and go away, when now we can actually work wherever we want, all right, how do we work in a virtual environment? We need to expand voter access and democratic participation. Once again, this isn't just a US thing. In fact, I'm thinking about Finland and Norway uh, and I'm thinking about several other countries that they have written into the library law that the library facilitates democratic conversations, hosting debates, hosting candidates, hosting issues. How do libraries truly help spark and move people to taking ownership of their government and transparency? We need to talk about how we provide that level of access. I go back to Oslo Public Library. Part of why they're providing that, if you go to their different branches around the city, each one feels very different because each one is in a different physical space that is with a different physical need. They really do want to look at being, some of them want to be the living room because they're in a gentrified neighborhood that doesn't have a lot of physical space in their location. Some of them want to be performance spaces. Some of them want to be reading hubs. And so the idea of bringing people in to participate in a democratic system, the other thing that went into Oslo, and by the way, Finland and these new libraries, because there's been a very big renaissance of the central library going on, primarily in the EU, but also in the US. And that is the idea of 
you know, we really do need a community here. We need to provide access to a community. Um, okay, sorry, I just lost my track of thought. We need to ensure the health and well-being of our communities, once again, through things like contact tracing, working with and under public health officials, but also thinking about mental health conditions and how do we connect them together, and essential crisis response capability. And once again, Don, I, I, really, I will cite it, but I'm going to steal it, that idea of being the second responder. What does that mean? How does that look? And doing this all under a larger sense of diversity, equity, and inclusion, because all of these have different, you know, whether you're in the US and you're talking about people of color and indigenous peoples are suffering each one of these categories. When you look in Europe and you look at the idea of refugees and mobile populations and immigrant populations, all of these become particularly uh, important to those groups. And so we need to really look at how do we transform it. And one of the things that's amazing is we have new partners to do it. It was one thing when we said, oh, we have a digital divide issue. Kids don't have access to the internet at home. Yeah, they'll get it on the bus, they'll go to school. Well, if we don't have a bus in school because we're doing this virtually, we've just disenfranchised them, right? If we, if we talk about, um, oh, we'll just send them and they'll work at home. And people from Google to the local convenience store are sending their folks home to work and finding out they don't have access because it was either too expensive, it was in a rural setting, they don't have, they, you know, Spectrum didn't pull the line today, et cetera. These are now our partners to go and truly advocate for these things. And so we need to look at new partnerships. And once again, I just, I'm gonna keep doing it. Shout back to Bendable. When I look at the partners who are doing this and why they're doing this, that's the model of how we push this forward. All right, so I'm gonna close this up and I just been rambling too much. So if I can find the mouse. No, keep going. I... <laughs> <laughs> That's all the slides. I'm done. I got nothing else to say. <laughs> all right. I, you, I don't believe that. Uh, on this, uh, this second responders point, this is a new term uh, yeah. that has taken hold. Uh, it was an excellent article uh, in the Atlantic last year by Deb Fallows when libraries are second responders. Uh, I didn't post a link, but you can find it. Just yeah, I'll go find it. Yeah. Yeah. And we have been looking at, you know, kind of disaster scale kind of situations uh, when, you know, the, everything goes out, what do you do? What's the communication you call that? But she made the point that disasters come at all scales from national, regional, now global, but to personal. And that this is one of the, one of the areas that, that libraries do so well. And I, I appreciated the way your remark about, you know, not how can I help you, but what do you want to learn? And it's invariably, you know, the, the question, I guess, that, that are driving people. Your point on motivation, I mean, all of those were, were relevant, but it, it's essential to learning. I mean, okay. if you're motivated enough, you can learn almost anything. I mean, it's just astounding. If you're not motivated, it's also astounding how little you can actually <laughs> learn. Um, so uh, we, have, we have a few questions. One related to your slides. Are those available? I mean, they're I'd recorded. Be happy to and we'll put provide the them to you as well. Uh, but if you have a link for those, that's also great. Uh, but uh, like uh, with the, uh, uh, the bendable slide, yep. we'll be happy to forward them. But if you have a place uh, that they're posted, you can put the link up. I'll send the um, link and I'll also put them on my blog where you can find way too much stuff. If, so. I think the thing that struck me the most, David, uh, about your remarks, your presentation, your orientation, and, and the prior uh, presentation was that community is the key to this, you know, the key to motivation, the key to civic engagement, you know, uh, to relating to people. We And you also did a great job of kind of describing the library not as an either or, but a blend of, of environments, you know, yeah. virtual, physical, and and it just, it also struck me that, you know, for the last 10 years, at least we've talked about libraries as the third place and the spaces, right? And the redesign of libraries to accommodate all these different, you know, maker spaces and all these kinds of things you, you, you listed. And now suddenly that, you know, that rug has kind of been pulled out and yet here we are, we're still in operation and that's, that's why, that was what triggered the first question. You know, what is a library now? It's, it's, 
it's open, but it, the building is closed. So what does that mean? So that's really been the trigger for all this. Um, questions well, for Just David. real quickly, because I finally remember what I was going to say. Yeah. With the Oslo Public Library, it was part, there was a large study um, coming, coming out of the, the Oslo University, their Department of Library Information Science. They also work with Hungary and Germany. And they did a study to ask sort of what's the role of um, cultural heritage libraries, museums in this world. And what they found was the more service that were being digitized, and, and once again, this is where Europe, European English and American English sometimes smash. So meaning services that were going online and being digitally provided. So now if you needed help, you had to go online. They said, as this was happening, the need for the physical space was increasing. People needed a place to go and one, be community. Yes, get support, but also get some grounding. And I think what we're all finding in this pandemic is our home was that way, but now it's like we're grounded. I'm tired of this house. Um, but that, you know, it is, it's a hybrid. We, you know, as, as more people need digital, what they found was more people need physical and they're the same people. So, sorry. No, uh, exactly. Uh, it reminds me of the, uh, uh, the quote by the famous uh, philosopher, Johnny Cash, who said, uh, flesh and blood needs flesh and blood. <laughs> uh, but Those it, it's true, time. and that was obvious, I think, from the 90s with the explosion of the web, that the more digital everything got, the more we would need each other. We would need uh, uh, personal interactions. Uh, I think that's what gave rise to Meetup so much, is this tool for people to find each other with common interests. Uh, and now, you know, we still need that, and yet I don't think we understand what is happening to us, how this restrictions, how civilization, global civilization has been transformed overnight yeah. to conform to what the virus allows us to do and, and where to be. Uh, we've never seen anything like that. And, yeah, it, and it, I, I and remember it also sets up the, what, what I want to ask you about oh, yeah. was this, this, the, 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 uh, the role of trust. Yeah. I mean, libraries are, famous is, is, you know, perhaps the most trusted institution we have. So how does that work now? What, what, do, what can libraries do with that precious asset in response? How can they guide their communities uh, in, in, in using the, the way the communities and individuals feel about them? Yeah, so shameless plug, I've got a book coming out next year. Manuscript just finished today, so it's on my mind. Talking about sort of the history of data and media and, and I get into trust. And what's interesting is right now the military, if you look at the Gallup polls and a lot of the studies of who do you find trustworthy and ethical, the military is at the top. And the military, and that's a radical change since the 1970s when the military oh. was pretty close to the bottom. And meanwhile, other traditional sources from government and Congress, which by the way, Congress is one step above used car salesmen. I'm not making that up. Um, and, and presidential administration. Media, television and print media, local media does better than the media in general. And libraries have been going up. And the question that, why? Um, and I think in large part, we need to understand that trust a lot of people would describe that, oh, we're objective and we're neutral and we don't get involved. And, and it's exactly the opposite, which is you, to become trusted, you act consistently in a, way, in a way that is beneficial to the relationship that you're building. In other words, I trust my library not because they're neutral. I trust my library because they're going to help my kid read. I trust my library because, yes, um, I know they'll put aside sort of personal political feelings to help me answer a reference question, but it's not the fact that they don't have them. And so we, we, you know, one of the things that we're finding is this agenda notion. When we talk about building a community, it's not simply enough to, here's a bunch of resources, good luck. It's also to say, where do we as a community want to go and how do we get there? Uh, one, since Drucker came up, but I don't, and I don't attest to be a Drucker um, scholar by any means, but management philosophy. If you don't have a direction, if you're not going somewhere, whether it's building and earning more money or a new product or whatever it is, if you're just sort of maintaining, people start picking at each other because it's like, you know, they, if you have no place to look outside the window, they start looking inside. And so part of a library's job building that trust, rebuilding community given the situation is to go somewhere. And we also know that, for example, the separation of ideolog ideologies and sort of partisanship that's going on, once again, around the world, not just in the US, 
um, libraries really, we know that as you get more and more local, those divides actually get smaller and smaller. And so we know that, you know, you'll talk to a neighbor, you may not agree about politics, but you're not going to call them a heretic and burn them down, etc. You'll disagree and walk on the other side of the street. But <laughs> libraries should use that local community connect connection, not just public libraries, but school libraries, academic libraries, to re-knit our community together, to create this new normal. And that new normal's got to be a more civil and productive conversation that's going on around how we distribute resources and power and all those wonderful things. I'm glad you mentioned uh, academic and school libraries and, and community facilitation uh, of various conversations. Uh, we've long thought that the, that the reinvention of the library is probably the most effective thing a community can do to reinvent itself, to think about what it wants, what's it's gonna be. But how can, how can public school and academic librarians collaborate? How, what, what project can they work on together, which they can because they have this common training. This is extremely rare. Right. Nobody else across those institutions can actually have converse, meaningful conversations other than the libraries librarians and the network administrators. <laughs> those two groups definitely can. But how, how, how could they? What would you, what would you see those, those librarians and those, and, you know, bounded by geography, uh, what, what could they do together? They don't seem to work that much together. The institutions definitely don't. Right. The, I, I used to call it Daedalus's maze. The, the, you know, librarians took all the tools we used to organize the world and started to organize ourselves, right? So, you know, ALA does not have an org chart try, I dare you to try and find an org chart for the American Library Association. You will not because it's too complicated to put on paper um, because they're so subdivided into 3,000 different groups. So that's one is we need to, to build and not divide. Um, and so a couple of successful uh, examples that I think lead to larger ones. The first was we hosted a series, Karen Gavigan, who's a brilliant faculty, uh, one of my faculty members here in school libraries, hosted a series of conversations that your seniors are our freshmen. And it was the realization that high school, school librarians were sending people to college and they were becoming college freshmen. And what did they need to know? And one of the things we found out from this conversation was librarians, the minute they found out that our university required information literacy as part of their core curriculum, we produced materials that they could take to their principals going, this is why we're important because if they don't have these skills, they're not going to go to the University of South Carolina, our flagship university. Um, and so though, but we wouldn't have known that had that not been a conversation we sat down uh -huh. with. Um, there was a great event, a great group in Illinois, uh, public and school librarians, and they started with just having dinner once and twice a month. And it turned into this whole series, one of which was uh, teacher loan programs, which I, I really like the idea of being able to loan out teachers, but that's not what they meant. Uh, mm -hmm. The idea that a teacher could, you know, leave after grading all day, drive in the library, literally walk behind the desk of the library, pick up materials that was waiting for them and walk out the door. And so that turned into a conversation about what were those materials, which turned into a conversation about curriculum. Here in um, the Columbia area in Casey in South Carolina, it turned into a matter of, we actually got the city council on board so that no city council event occurred without a literacy component. They didn't care if you were opening a new garbage transfer station or if you were having a picnic or whatever, it had to have a literacy component. That turned into a bilingual literacy component and all of it turned into economic development. We know that, for example, when Boeing transferred from Kansas and um, Seattle to Charleston area in, in South Carolina, I apologize for all my local examples, but that's what I got. Right. They said, we have a high-tech manufacturing facility. A lot of what we do in the aerospace industry is we use computing, you know, computing-driven manufacturing machines. We need people with skills. They went to hire people out of high school. They didn't have the skills. They started a bunch of STEM programs and rocket programs, and they found out that people weren't getting to high school, weren't reading. They've actually now implemented literacy programs at third grade. We know if in the U.S., if you're not reading at reading level by third grade, your chances of graduating high school go down dramatically. Like we're talking 50s percents. And we know that if you don't graduate from high school, the chance of incarceration goes up dramatically. And so the idea of working at Boeing, 
to their great credit said, we're gonna start at third grade so that we have people to hire when they graduate from high school. And that's gonna take everyone from school librarians to the public librarians. We found out, for example, language was a problem. That when you talk about literacy in the classroom, third, fourth grade literacy, you talk about literacy, you usually mean things like decoding text and encoding and scaffolding knowledge and really sort of cognitive functions. When you talk literacy in the, in the children's sections of public libraries, 99.9% .9 they're talking about language enrichment, the love of reading and giving them access. So what happens is parents were going between these two and kids were going between these two and the same words were being used and none of the meaning was shared. And so just literally getting people together is essential. Sorry, I'm well, That's great. We would love to, uh, and I think we will find a way to see if we can, uh, maybe we could call this a K-20 librarian. Uh, yeah. Get, uh, get all these types together and, and talk about the potential for, and you make the point, uh, without the building, you know, what, what, what difference does it make what your level is in terms of where you are and what you're learning? What's it, let me put another, what's it between a virtual high school and a virtual community college? Right. You know, and, and I think I read recently that California spends the annual budget of one of its state universities every year on remedial education for high school kids that are not actually at the freshman level. So uh, we have run over a bit our, our Sorry, hour, sure. but I have no regrets. And I hope the people that are still with us, which are the great majority who signed in in the first place, don't either. But I think this will be a good place to close the recording and we'll hang out for another few minutes. Uh, next week, uh, you made several references to Europe. I appreciate that. Next, next week, we're going to have, thanks to uh, uh, Stephen, uh, we're going to have the uh, uh, library director for Portugal. Uh, I mean, the national library director is going to be on. And we're also going to have um, uh, Carson Block, who led uh, toward, a gigabit, toward gigabit libraries, a study on measuring connectivity and so forth. A uh, very interesting study, but in careful tools that they've developed there for next week. Um, these, and I think today uh, is a, a great example of that, but these, this series will represent a de facto historical record of kind of how, how we've thought about this, you know, kind of week by week as we've gone through this, this pandemic. And, and I, I, I don't know what the value that's gonna be because <laughs> things seem dated pretty quickly these days, uh, but we'll find out. Um, so, with that, let's close the recording. Uh, but before we do, I'd like to ask everybody to unmute. Can everybody unmute, please, everybody? And I'd like to give a hand to our speakers, if, if you could, please. Let's give them a hand. This is great. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Come back next week, uh, and we'll see you then. Thanks for uh, terminating today's official. But thank you, thank you, thank you. Minutes.